if we proactively and intentionally create space in our lives to really push our cognitive abilities to the limit, look what can open up in your life. I'd like to welcome Christina Roman to the Productivities Podcast. Thanks for joining me, Christina. I am so excited to be here. I feel like it's been a long time in the making, and I am psyched. Yeah, it's it's one of those things where um, when you have episodes planned very far in advance and recorded, and um, we're getting, I'm going to go behind the scenes a little bit with this episode to a degree, <laughs> that you have this ability to make some changes. And I think the reason, if I remember correctly, that we had to postpone. I'm, I, I was actually looking back at this and mm-hmm. I said, the reason that we have to postpone is um, because uh, I got sick and fell behind. So it wasn't like I was sick when we were supposed to do it, but I've fallen behind. And it was one of those things where because I was so able to have the podcast done early enough that I'm like, okay, well, this interview isn't going up for a while so I can make a change. And you were very flexible, which I really do appreciate. Well, I try to be, <laughs> and I think you were you were gracious enough to accept a cold pitch from me. I pride myself on my pitching abilities, and I like to send really personalized, customized emails that really show, and they're always genuine, that I've paid attention, that I've really listened to the podcast that I'm pitching myself for, and that I really truly respect your work. So I'm I'm just going out the gate with lots of flattery, but it's all very genuine. <laughs> so so yeah, thank you for accepting my request. Well, I appreciate it. When you, and I get a lot of cool pitches. And one of the things that, that when I saw what you sent me, I, it piqued, no pun intended, my interest <laughs> <laughs> because of, so you, were, you. <laughs> so you were in peak coaching. But the other thing is we talked about this just before I hopped on the call is Right when you go to the website, and I'll link to it in the show notes, um, right kind of above the fold is get into a deep work state in 15 minutes. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, oh, well, that speaks my language. The idea mm-hmm. of, of you know, we, we just talked before uh, we started recording about Cal Newport. And, of course, I've had him on the show on a couple of occasions, but you, you're, you're in a, you live in the same area that he is. And so, there's yeah. a, so I'm like, you know what? Let's, I mean, there's a lot of great things that I noticed right out of the gate. But one of the things that, that, um, that piqued my interest was the idea of how do you, how can, how do you get into a deep work state in that 15 minute span? Because a lot of people really want to get into that kind of, they they love the idea of it, right? They love the idea of being able to do that, but they, they don't know how, and they don't realize it's something that you could, you could literally engine, you can engineer to a degree. So can you share how you are able to do that? Maybe how you've been able to take that, um, that skill set and apply it to help others do the same. Yeah, absolutely. I love that term that you just used, engineered. And I'll just add on to that by saying I got feedback from one of the people who downloaded the guide. And he said, I love that it's a structured process. It's literally minute by minute breakdown of how to get into a deep work state. But there's so much flexibility within that process where you still have to generate your own answers. And it's still very customized to your own personal life. And so that was my goal with creating this step by step process. I love Cal Newport's work. I think he's an absolute genius. And I reread deep work for fun, which all my friends make fun of me for (laughs) Um, so many brilliant concepts. And then I also was in the midst of a year long life coaching certification program through the life coach school, Mm -hmm. bringing all of those methodologies in. So Cal's work, life coach school, and then reading books like uh, Atomic Habits by James Clear. Have you read that one? Yeah. Yeah. I've had James on the program too. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. I must've missed that. So having James's work and then all these other just really, really brilliant people who are talking about focus and productivity near Ayal. I was going to just mention him. He's been on the show. Near, <laughs> yeah. near, near's been on the show as well, especially. And what I love is is the idea of um, using very simple um, ways for people to connect to this. Like near talking about the yeah. idea of what the opposite of distraction is, which is yes. not you know productivity. It's traction, right? And and James talking about like making one small change, which can have this ripple effect. Uh, across multiple areas and knowing, I think the biggest thing is that a lot of people, and it goes back to my original question, which is, oh my God, I got to do this. I got to do this quickly Um, or adopting a system. Oh, I'm going to take on getting things done. Let me learn the whole thing. The Mm -hmm. most of what we, I mean, and you, you, you walking through people step by step and and we'll link to it in the show notes because you can, you, I mean, you want to go through this yourself. So you just add your email address and you can, you walk, you, you kind of, you know, help people with that. But the idea that, um, the idea that you can make, uh, 
you you can't do this all in one swift gulp or one swift step. It involves <laughs> like step by step and getting better at the little things yes. to help cultivate this ability to do, you know, deep work, uh, avoid distraction. Um, and we're going to dig deeper into the idea of procrastination because I want to go in some different uh, when I when I'm talking to somebody who studies this stuff, I can go into a completely different direction. Then. Tell me about procrastination. Like we won't be going there. It'll be like, OK, what about this? So um, but what like the fact that you just pointed out that friends made made fun of you because you read deep work, so much, <laughs> which I'm like, do you, do you keep in mind, deep work when you read it, like there's a whole bunch of, of footnotes at the back. So you could probably skip those. <laughs> a lot of people are like, oh, my God, like, you know, it's not it. Cal's works tend to have a lot of like you know, end notes to it. What was the one thing about that book that kind of said, I want to dig into this more more than than anything? Like I, what's the reread value that kind of said this? I need to be either reminded of this or I need to uncover new new truths or new new situations by going over this this book on a on a regular basis. Love that question. The first thing that pops into my head is cognitive abilities. Mm. And I spend so much of my day as a business owner, as a coach, as a really avid self-growth person, <laughs> I spend so much time thinking, how can I push myself beyond what I think I'm capable of mm. cognitively? And that idea that there are, again, these brilliant superstars who you've had all on your show, which is amazing, what a lineup, that everyone's done this research and everyone comes back to the same thing, which is if we proactively and intentionally create space in our lives to really push our cognitive abilities to the limit, look what can open up in your life. Like, Look how your life can become so incredible, not just in your professional life, but how can that have then ripple effects in the rest of your life? And I get, I mean, I get goosebumps talking about it. I think it's one of the most exciting things that we can do as thinking humans. And then I'll add on to that, that the other huge benefit that I talk about a lot with my clients or the people who download the guide is it's not just about producing better work. It's also about coming face to face with yourself. Mm. And that is game changing. Right. And actually that, that as we talk about this um, right now, and, and, and honestly, I know I, I'm, I'm making these episodes as timeless as possible because, you know, but there are certain scenarios in your life where things can become overwhelming and you need to be able to make a, a slight adjustment or alteration or just honestly have some empathy and grace towards yourself when it comes to how much deep work one can get done. Right. Yeah. So absolutely. I think that that the other thing that can come up is there's this myth of, OK, if I'm not getting a bunch of deep work done, then I'm not being productive. And right. I think that um, you you get to decide what deep work is. And you also mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily always present itself as, you know, blood, sweat and tears kind of work. Mm -hmm. um, can you. Uh, for people who are feeling maybe that, and, and you, and this is one of the things you do is you, you talk about people who are feeling overwhelmed, you know, yeah. or, or rushed or whatever. Um, they've probably got this bias about themselves that, oh, well, I can't do deep work cause that's heavy lifting stuff that I just can't do. Like there's no way because of all these other things I've got going on or I'm overwhelmed by the way, you know, my life is going right now. And this, this lack of harmony between work and life or this, this disconnect. Can we spend a little bit of time talking about like, like deep work doesn't have to be this, yeah. you know, this, uh, opus, <laughs> this opus <laughs> of like life changing, uh, you know, purposeful, amazing stuff. And it can be something much, much simpler than that. Absolutely. I think for me, when I talk about deep work, I'm like, what could I pick um, Like, what can I, how can I tap into my potential again, as a, as a human and a business owner and all these things. And it is for me really a grand thing in my life, but I also have decided to dedicate all of this time and energy. So I love your point that for other people, you might not be wondering what can I create with all this deep work time? You might simply want to leave the office at 6 PM mm. and stop thinking about work after that. And that could take the, the form of one deep work block per day. For me, I might do, let's say four deep work blocks per day. Or I just actually carved out my entire schedule and spent an entire week knocking out one course in 
in a week. Right. So for me, like that's awesome. I love being able to do that. But you're absolutely right. For people who, let's say, have kids or have corporate jobs or have a lot more structure, a lot more external things that they're that they feel like they have to take into account, it can be as simple as one hour every single day. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. All right, we're going to take a break from the episode to talk about our sponsors for this episode. Okay, I don't really get investing. Sure, I've I've spent some time studying it a little bit here and there, but by and large, I don't really know what to do. I mean, okay, I know that you really should have a diversified portfolio. That much I know. So stocks, bonds, mutual funds. But recently, I've looked at some of those more successful portfolios. So like some of the most successful portfolios. And what I've seen and what you'll typically see is a diversified set of real estate in there. But here's the thing. Why isn't real estate one of the first asset classes that you consider or that I would even consider when looking to diversify? Well, the answer is simple. It's because it hasn't been available to investors like you and me until now. And that's thanks to Fundrise. You see, Fundrise makes it easy for all investors like you, like me, to diversify by building you a portfolio of institutional quality real estate investments. So whether you're just starting to invest in real estate like I am or looking to add more, Fundrise has you covered. And here's how they do it. See, Fundrise is an investing platform that makes investing in high quality, high potential real estate as easy as investing in your favorite stock or mutual fund. Now, whether you're looking to add stable cash flow via dividends, or maybe you prefer long-term growth through appreciation, either way, Fundrise has you covered. To date, Fundrise manages more than $1 billion in assets for over 130,000 investors. And since 2014, the Fundrise platform has averaged 8.7 to 12.4% annual returns, and investors have earned more than $79 million in dividends alone. Fundrise's team of real estate professionals carefully vets and actively manages all of the real estate projects. And with their easy-to-use website, it's super simple, really. It's super simple. You can track your portfolio's performance and watch as properties across the country are acquired, improved, and operated via asset updates. I've gone to the website. It's, It's really simple to get started. And if you want to start building your better portfolio today, then here's what you got to do. You get started at fundrise.com slash timecrafting to have your first 90 days of advisory fees completely waived. So that's fundrise, F-U-N-D-R-I-S-E dot com slash timecrafting and get the first 90 days of advisory fees waived. So what are you waiting for? Go to fundrise.com slash timecrafting today and start investing and building your better portfolio now. If you run a small business, and even if you don't, you have to know, it's no secret that small businesses have unique needs. And really, despite the current uncertainty, one thing remains unchanged. And that's the importance of having the right people on your team. When your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so that you can find the right person quickly. Now, I've looked at LinkedIn jobs from both sides of the coin, and I have to say it's a really quick and targeted experience, I guess is the best way for me to put it. I'm almost at the verge of being able to hire somebody in my local area. I want to work with someone one-on-one, and by using LinkedIn jobs, I'm going to be able to find that match, that person that's going to 
be able to fill that need of whether it's an executive assistant role or maybe I'm looking for videography because I'm doing more video these days. Nonetheless, LinkedIn Jobs is easy to use and there's a wealth of talent that is already using LinkedIn, so I'm going to be able to leverage that. Remember, LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with more than 690 million members worldwide, and LinkedIn Jobs screens candidates with the hard and soft skills, and that's a big one that you're looking for. So it puts your job post in front of qualified members every day so that it's seen by people looking for jobs like yours. So we'll see. I post a job, we're going to see how quickly. And and I mean, I have to say that I was kind of lost as to where I was going to put this kind of posting. Um, I looked at a bunch of different options and LinkedIn, I naturally go there. I gravitate towards there. So I'm going to give LinkedIn jobs a try because I'm feeling like my business is ready. And, and after going through the experience of just looking and exploring LinkedIn jobs, I think it's a no brainer. And now I've got an offer that's a no brainer for you as well. So when your business is ready to make that next hire, just find the right person with LinkedIn jobs by paying what you want and get the first $50 off. So this is, this is how it works. Just visit linkedin.com slash timecrafting and get $50 off your first job post. So it's really simple. There are some, some terms and conditions that apply, but just visit linkedin.com slash timecrafting and you'll get $50 off your first job post. Take advantage of what LinkedIn jobs is offering you today, because if you're ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn jobs is where you're going to want to go. That's linkedin.com slash timecrafting and get that $50 off your first job post today. And now let's get back to my conversation with Christina Roman here on the Productivityist podcast. As much as I have a deep work day, I also have what I call my wolf workout, which Mm -hmm. I mean, and and it's funny because, you know, this is something that is now it needs to be part of what I do on the regular because if I don't, then I notice. I just notice <laughs> that my physical, you know, my, you know, my body, my energy levels, all that stuff can't sustain the rigors of a day. And um, the reason I call it a wolf workout is because uh, we, and we talked about this before we jumped on, is I'm a night owl. And the wolf is what Dr. Michael Bruce calls a night owl. So for me, my wolf workout takes place between, it's only an hour, between 5 and 6 p.m. before dinner. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've blocked it out for seven days of the week. And it's either I go do yoga or I go for a run, one or the other. It's and, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, defining and that took the interesting thing is the deep work around that didn't just happen in it doesn't just happen when I'm in it. Right. It right. also happened leading up to it, like mm-hmm. figuring out, OK, I don't like lifting weights. I've never liked lifting weights. Why do I keep trying to get myself to lift? Weights? <laughs> like, why, yeah. what's the point? Right. Um, I. I lift heavy stuff on other occasions that are not related to weight. So as long as I lift that heavy stuff, I should be okay. Um, mm-hmm. More, It's more about flexibility, more about like resistance with what yoga offers. And honestly, the, the endurance and cardio that I can get from going for a run from my house to the ocean and back is a, is a good, good five miles. So if I do that like every other day, um, and, and the reason I, and, and interestingly, I've blocked out seven days of the week, but it doesn't mean I do it all seven days of the week. It mm-hmm. means that it's there as a stark, for lack of better, stark reminder. It's at this point where it's a stark reminder because if I don't do it, then I know what the the byproduct is. But even like fitness and those things that are rather elemental or or, um, not necessarily pertaining to work, because that's the other thing is people go, oh, deep work. Well, that's related to work. No, it doesn't have to be. Right, absolutely. Well, and I would love to actually reflect back something that you just alluded to when you were talking about the workout, because I think this will actually be really helpful for listeners, is this idea that it sounds like what you did, whether it was consciously or not, is instead of just looking at the actions, so I'm going to go do yoga or I'm going to run, it sounds like what you did was look at the actual result of those actions. So more physical fitness. Right. Like second order thinking, basically. Yeah. um, Shane Parrish talks about this on a blog post. You know, for those of you who don't know what second order thinking is, it's really important to get that stuff down because that is a catalyst for because you go deeper by, by nature of you doing a going into the second tier of what the like the effect of it is you are by virtue and by default going into a deeper level of thinking because you're you're not thinking about well I should work out because I'm going to get in shape I want to work out because 
if I don't work out, I'm not going to be able to live long enough to spend time with my grandkids and I won't be able to be mobile enough and I won't look, you know, I won't be able to uh, imagine a productivity guy on stage, uh, mm-hmm. you know, and saying, hey, you should do all this stuff. And I'm not looking terribly healthy. Um, mm-hmm. How how impactful will my will my messaging be like by looking at it from that vantage point? That's not that's not just simple. Well, I should work out because people are saying I should work out because that's my age. I'm thinking about the the second tier, the third, like, you know, like that second order thinking. You're right, absolutely. And I don't think I think people feel so rushed that they say, "Oh, I don't have time to consider that stuff." Um, yeah. Especially when they're working in groups, like when they're trying to accomplish some group stuff. There's also the pressure that's coming from other people, and you also don't have as much agency over what they're doing. And I know that's something that you help people with as well is the idea of like collaborative work and getting into deeper work there. Can we mm-hmm. touch on that a bit? Because that can be a barrier for people too. Like, how can I get into deep work when there are other people that I'm relying on or working with on this group project so I can go from like this kind of ambiguous level of completion to we got it done and look at what, look at what we did. Yes, absolutely. Well, I, I want to touch really quick, make a pit stop at this sure. idea of slowing down to speed up. Mm-hmm. And I talk about this all the time. So I say coaching, dedicating an hour of your week to being coached, and then the time to do the assignments that I give you, that takes time. But right. it's an example of slowing down to speed up. Right. Or taking these 15 minutes to get into a deep work state to ensure that your actual deep work session is going to be effective, slowing down to speed up. Right. So, so many examples, obviously working out, meditation. I just started uh, the Ziva meditation. Do you know that? No, I don't. I use, have you been using Muse for a long time, but I don't know. uh, I don't know that one. It's a Emily Fletcher, if you're interested. My mom actually just sent me her book. I got a surprise package in the mail with the book. Um, That's great. Yeah. Send me the link. I'll drop it in the show notes for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, She would be an amazing guest, but... Yeah, perfect examples of slowing down to speed up. And so really selling yourself on that idea that this is really important to take this time to plan accordingly and to really look at your results that you want to create and then work backwards. So if I know my result that I want to create, my actions are going to fall into place so much easier, more easily Mm -hmm. because I'm not going to be so confused about what direction I'm going in. So that's huge, huge point that I think is really important for people to potentially take away from our conversation. And then the other point I wanted to make about this idea of doing deep work in a group is I would recommend to people that they first really buy in themselves on deep work and really prove the value to themselves. So I always say to my clients, I can talk your ear off for days on end about the value of deep work or about the value of coaching, but you seeing it or understanding it on an intellectual level is never going to have the same effect as you actually doing it. Right. So if you're going to try to bring deep work into a group setting, you have to fully buy in yourself. So what is your thought on that? Uh, Yeah, I think that, I think that if you don't, and I say this a lot when it comes to people, like if you aren't willing to respect the boundaries that you set for yourself, you can't expect anybody else to. So you have to, um, and you, and you alluded to the idea of slowing down to speed, to speed before you speed up. And I've often said like, slow down, slow the right things down so you can speed the right things up. And I think that, that when you put those kind of, when you, when you realize that you are often the biggest barrier because of the biases that you have, whether it's, Oh, I don't have time to do this, which is again, you have more time than you think. Um, When you say that, uh, you know, I, I need to dig into deep work, um, but I don't know how to tap into that. Um, so therefore, uh, I'm not going to go down that path because, you know, I just don't see the benefit. If you don't spend some time, which we do have way more of than we actually consider, when you start to put that those pieces into place, then the, the buy-in, it makes it easier for you to buy in. But you have to build that stuff up. And we talked about this um, early on, like the idea of doing little, little small steps, like the idea of, and I think we talked about this before we jumped on, but the idea of, okay, um, and even more so during our conversation, the idea of James ha- James Clear's Atomic Habits, right? Like the little things. When you start to do those little things and have proof, right? Have yeah. proof that it works, then it makes it easier to buy in because you're not sitting there going, okay, well, th- this, this, I don't think this can work because I have no evidence, anecdotal yes. or otherwise, <laughs> that it's going right. to work. But if you could say, oh, well, you know, like, again, um, wow, uh, you know, I am at a better 
uh, I, I do know that I should be working out at this time of day because, you know, all signs point towards this. Or, you know what, I know that I'm better at doing uh, administrative stuff earlier in the day because uh, I'm more creative later in the day. So, therefore, there's some evidence there. Like, any little pieces of clues that you can give your brain helps you with buy-ins on those bigger things. And then, not I think the other thing that helps there is the apply, application of it, right? Like, Yes. Giving, giving it a go. Remembering that we live in this real, uh, and this is this will lead to our procrastination conversation in a little bit, but we live in this world where we often get the message like, uh, you know, do do it now because tomorrow you, you never know if you get tomorrow. Or, you know, like there's all this messaging about um, do as much as you can now because tomorrow is not guaranteed and things like that. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's an important message to a point, but I think right. we often take things to the extreme, right? Well, I better do it all because... You know, I might not wake up the next day or, you know, um, opportunity knocks only once and things like that. But we have to realize that we're human. Right. Mm -hmm. And we can't get all the things done in a day. And also we have to know that, you know, um, tomorrow we have another chance to to make the day to engineer the day that we want. And we have another day and another. And that's why, like, I'm a big guy who uh, I'm a guy who plans like the Mm -hmm. decade. I will put plans in place for the next 10 years. And people go, oh, well, why would you do that? Uh, you know, uh, how do you know what's going to happen? We could be facing some kind of crisis or something like that. Or you never know where you're going to be in five years. So what's the point of planning? Um, mm-hmm. I allude to the whole, like, Eisenhower quote of planning is useful, but plans are useless, right? Like the idea <laughs> of I need to know that that stuff's there because it makes it easier for me to buy into the fact that this is something I should work on because Mike from months ago, years ago, said that I should do that. When you start to put those kind of pieces together, it makes it a little bit, it makes it that much easier for you to do the things that only, that will hit, help you hit those higher levels of achievement and get to those levels of deeper work rather yeah. than just kind of going through the, the, the day. And it, sometimes you need to. Sometimes you just need to go through the day. But if you have these waypoints, it's helpful. And I think that that helps with the buy-in. Does that make sense? It all makes so much sense, and you're breaking my brain because I there's so much there's good stuff unpack. here. <laughs> no, it's, there. it's it's great. I just want to say so to recap that piece about evidence, so important. And it's funny, right before you said the word evidence, I wrote down we're always creating evidence in every single moment, mm. and that evidence can be amazing, and it can really propel us towards the person we want to be. Or we can use evidence to validate our crappy belief systems. Right. And so actually procrastination is such an interesting example of this. I always joke that in my marketing, I market to procrastinators. And then I say, I'm like Hansel and Gretel. I breadcrumb you in to my home of peak coaching. And as soon as you walk in the door of my little cottage, I go, never call yourself a procrastinator ever again. Mm, right. <laughs> It's because when you call yourself a procrastinator all the time and you have that label that you've assigned to yourself or perfectionist is a huge other one, Yep. always going to unconsciously seek evidence of that belief system. Not only seek evidence, but create evidence. Well, it's the same reason why you don't say to kids, you're, you're bad. You're a bad boy. You'd yeah. say you did a bad thing. Mm-hmm. There's a difference because it's an identity thing versus an activity thing, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So what I say, actually, if you do identify as a procrastinator, I say your first step is just to tack one word to the front of that. And it's historically. Historically, I've been a procrastinator. Mm. And once you believe that thought where you're like, okay, I have a little bit of wiggle room and I'm not quite identified, then you say, historically, I've identified as a procrastinator. And that's even more wiggle room to get yourself out of that self-fulfilling prophecy. It's amazing how words can just make a, a huge difference. Like just one word. Yes, that's I I've been practicing. I I wrote down actually on my computer, treat everything like a mic drop because I know that I tend to talk really fast. And Mm. so I'm trying to slow down the way that I talk. And so what I say now, one word to change your identity about being a procrastinator, just one word. Mm -hmm. I, I get all excited because I'm like, oh, it's so just a little little mic drop. (laughs) And the other thing is about words is that they're like I like to use the word prudent now. It's funny. I was talking about I have an initiative that I've I've founded called Prudent Productivity, mm-hmm. uh, and one of my friends says, "Why don't you call it Practical Productivity?" Because prudence is really the na- that word is kind of it's it's an older word, but 
mm-hmm. it's still one of the cardinal virtues, right? Like it's one of the four cardinal virtues. Not it's not related to. Um, I mean, it is part of like a more of a of um, uh, a religious kind of uh, virtue level because they add three more to the add the, to to make them more the uh, the the religious virtues. But the four cardinal vir- virtues, the mother of all virtues, is prudence, and prudence is really practical wisdom. That's what they. That, so now people are calling it. You know, that's why he said, "Why do you call it practical productivity?" And the the reason that I told him, I said point blank, I'm like because practical productivity doesn't emote any kind of emotion. Mm-hmm. It doesn't. Prudence does like be prudent. First off, it gets people curious. What's prudent mean? And then when they Mm -hmm. see what it means, which is like to be wise in action, wise in thought, to have some foresight, to be, you know, to 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 do things with reason. That sounds like, oh, I I really want to do that because there's there's a virtue attached to it. So it's virtuous and people want to be virtual, virtuous. They do. Mm -hmm. Um, And all of a sudden it leads to other things like especially, you know, since Plato is one of the people that can't, you know, discussed it. Right. All of a sudden, you, you start to hear about uh, it, it makes you make some changes around what you do, right? Because the word that you attach to something matters. Mm-hmm. It's it's the the same thing I'll say about simple and easy. Simple and easy are two different things. Something mm-hmm. that is simple doesn't necessarily mean that it's easy, right? Yeah. Right. And by the same token, something that's easy doesn't necessarily mean that it's simple. Because mm-hmm. in some cases, you could have been doing the same complicated thing all the time, but because you've been doing it, it's now easy, right? Like, it's just something that you do. So words, like adding that historically to the beginning of it, it changes yeah. the perspective of what, and if you want to change history, because you, you can apply it in, in, the, in the inverse, too. You can say, well, historically, I've been this, and I yeah. really want to make sure that I don't lose this mm-hmm. in this new scenario, so therefore, I'm going to keep it. Whereas you, it can also play another role. Well, historically, I've been a procrastinator. I want to change history, right? So yeah. words, you know, and that's why like mantras, it's the reason why mantras exist. It's the reason why, you know, like things like, you know, deep work. There's a great example of a, like some people, I, I, when I work with them and I talk about doing deep work, is that if that term doesn't resonate, then you mm-hmm. might want to use something like full focus or you might want to yeah. use something like uh, some people equate deep work with high energy, Right. So there's a level of, of, of understanding that everything is personal when it comes to, to a lot of this stuff um, mm-hmm. and words that, to, to that degree as well. Because the most important word to you in, your, in the language, whether you want it, is your name. That's the most mm-hmm. important word to you, right? Beyond that, how that, that informs everything else. So, you know, oh, this word means this. This word means that. You, your brain, you've been wired, whether through um, environment, conditioning all that stuff to what those words actually mean. If you start to introduce yeah. a new word, like I've never heard anybody say historically, I've mm-hmm. been this historically, that changes the way that you not only think about, but the way you feel. And once yep. you start to apply both emotion and logic to a situation, then mm-hmm. you're being, I'm circling back, prudent because that's reason. <laughs> and so there's a nice intersection there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. I want to, I want to shift gears. Sure. And talk about procrastination to a different degree than, than we, we've talked about so far. So I want to go back to when when I said off the top and we were talking about like how we postponed our initial conversation. Mm-hmm. And the idea that I've got podcast episodes scheduled far into the future with interviews already recorded. Um, that you could say, most people would say, wow, that's really proactive of you. And mm-hmm. it is. But there can also be some danger there too, which if you get, and this is the level of procrastination I want to talk about where you get so far ahead that you have this belief that you can afford to procrastinate, right? So mm-hmm. you can afford to, so the, the affordability of procrastination what is what I want to talk about and understand, like, how do you, when you're working with people, help them understand the cost of misjudging or mm-hmm. um, not understanding that, there is only so much procrastination you can afford because comfort can turn to complacency, right? Like there's, there's mm-hmm. again, words <laughs> and procrastination yeah. can be this thing where, um, and, and Rory Vaden's talked about the suit procrastinate on purpose. Procrastination got a bad, it's, it has a bad rap around that. But that the reason that he used that term is because it's not about, he's really not talking about procrastinating. He's talking about delaying, right? He's talking yep. about like being, yep, yep, yep. And so, I want to talk about that, like the idea of affordability, like how much, quote, procrastination, I'll put in air quotes, 
uh, can one afford to have before it becomes costly? Brilliant question. I love it. So let's start with just revisiting what you said, which I think is so, so important. And I like the idea of re re-angling or reframing the word procrastination and actually embracing it. But what I've been doing with my clients is saying, if it is not something that is actually procrastination, stop calling it procrastination. So right. some examples. Intentionally, I actually had a friend who said, I'm so excited to check out your guide for getting into a deep work state. She's on sabbatical right now and she's about to start a new job. And she said, I'm so excited to dig into it in two weeks. And that to me is such a simple example. It's not procrastination. She doesn't carry around this guilt or shame that she's not digging into it yet, which I think is often the indicator that you're actually procrastinating is what is your emotion about that action or lack of action. Mm -hmm. And so she just decided intentionally, I'm going to binge watch Netflix in for the next two weeks during my sabbatical. And then right before, you know, a week before I start my new job, that's when I'm going to start really digging in. And so I think that, again, is a really clear example of don't call something procrastination if it's not. So I think on the flip side, I also include in procrastinating some other things that I don't think are historically included under the umbrella. And so for me, the the big ones are hemming and hawing over decisions I consider procrastination. Right. And I see it with my clients. They wouldn't call it procrastination, but they take months to make a decision. And so that's a form of basically pushing off the negative emotion that you think you might feel if you make the wrong decision. Right. So you're procrastinating negative emotion, but the effect is you feel negative emotion in the interim. Does that make sense? Totally. And it's the same thing where I talk about when I talk about the productivity ROI, which is a, a scoring system for productivity. I say the things you need to do, the things you ought to do, and the things you want to do. Ought to do is like a, a lack of decision. Like you haven't decided whether it's something you need or want to do. Yeah, I ought to yeah. do this. I ought to do that. Well, eventually an ought to do will either turn into something you need to do, something you want to, or it'll just go away completely. Yeah. And, and so the, 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 and, and we were just at Costco yesterday. It's not, and again, this is not unusual. We go to Costco and the amount of decision fatigue that we have when we leave there is minimal because they make very few, they give you very few options, which mm -hmm. allows you to move forward with buying things that you need to buy. But also you end up walking out of there with things that you never expected to buy because you haven't been worn down by the process of shopping there. Right. Mm -hmm. So by this, when you start to hem and haw about something or you start to, you know, and, and again, this isn't deliberate hemming and hawing. This is just like, no. eh, then all of a yeah. sudden you're like, okay, um, you need to like step back. Like you said, slow down. You go, whoa, 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 whoa. clearly I'm, I, I, I'm not, I'm not clear about this. I haven't made a decision around it. And often it's because, you know, I've found that it's either the task is really big and you need mm -hmm. to really assess it better. Um, yep. or, or it's just, it's something that you really don't want to do and maybe something you don't need to do. And rather than like, procrastinate making the decision around that. that. That's the other thing too. You're procrastinating not on the actual thing. You're procrastinating making a decision on it, right? Yeah. But also fear. I think mm. fear is so pervasive because yeah. people are really tied to this idea that there's a right or a wrong decision. And when you truly are in that place where you think that this could go terribly wrong, then of course you're going to procrastinate making that decision because you don't want to face that reality that maybe you made the wrong decision. Yeah. And then ironically, because our human brains are so fascinating. We don't make any decision. And then some doors close and maybe they're doors we actually would have wanted to pursue, but we just kind of let them close because we didn't actively make a decision. Right. Or we just kind of stand paralyzed in front of all of these different options and we don't move forward with anything. And then that proves the belief system that we're not good at making decisions. So historically... What's worked <laughs> as we get close to wrapping up historically, what yeah. has worked for you um, on your own first and then through your training and through your, your, your deep work in this area, what's the historically, what's the one thing that people that you've done and that you kind of encourage people to do to kind of move past that barrier of, you know, a lack of decision-making, uh, hemming and hawing, uh, you know, d delaying without being deliberate about it. Uh, ultimately procrastinating um, yeah. that, that they can, that you can give them that will help them at least take that next step forward and feel, you know, 
feel past the fear, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a multiple step process that I do with my clients. So the first step is deceivingly, deceptively easy. Um, but you just ask yourself, am I ready to make a decision? And you will be shocked if you actually do this with a really tough decision, half the time or some portion of the time your brain goes, yeah, I already know the decision. I've known the decision. I just haven't been willing to admit it. But when I ask myself directly, I can't hide anymore. I'm ready to go. Or you come back and you say, no, I really do need more information. And then you purposefully and intentionally, I think those are the key words today, you enter what I call information gathering mode. And that's where you go out and you actually seek answers to get the additional information that you need. So that's, that's part of the process is that just asking yourself, am I ready to make a decision? And then using information gathering mode, if you are not ready to make a decision. And then I think something else that's really, really helpful. I need to, I'm a very visual person, so I need to make a visual of this, but basically imagine a four quadrant matrix where you have four different boxes. Mm -hmm. And I want you to go to worst case scenario for both decisions. So let's say you're between two different options. You go, what is the worst case scenario if I choose this route? Right. Okay. And then what is the worst case scenario if I choose this route? And then you go to the best case scenario of option one and the best case scenario of option two. You make peace with all of those different possibilities. So it could go terribly, terribly wrong. It could be the most incredible thing you've ever done. If you could really make peace with all of those, what would you then choose? And that at level of clarity is incredible to watch. Christina, this has been a great conversation. Um, we could keep going. Uh, yeah. We could, I know we could, but uh, in the interest of uh, giving our listeners a chance to step away from it and stop procrastinating on the thing you're procrastinating on right now, <laughs> yeah. um, we'll, we'll call it at this point, but where can people keep up with you and your work uh, so that they can, uh, they can, they can take things to the next level, make some, start making some choices and making some decisions around this stuff, get into some deep work and um, put off procrastinating, which is I ironic, <laughs> a weird way of putting it, but put off procrastination and maybe yes. get rid of that historical element that they've been, they've been kind of attaching to them, to themselves uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to procrastination. The best place to find me is if you go to peakcoaching.co slash deep work state. That's how to get the guide for how to get into a deep work state in 15 minutes. And that will get you on the email list as well. I send out weekly emails with all of this kind of information that you and I just talked about. So thank you so much for having me. Hey, thanks for being on the show today, Christina. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, again, take care of yourself. Thanks again for appearing on the Productivityist Podcast. Thanks. Take care.